Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much. And in particular, thank you to Mr. Russo again um, for helping me to put a profound human face on the work that we do, reminding us that we're looking after real people and that um, the, uh, the, the technical side that we see is really only a fraction of the, uh, the, the story. And for me, I found your story incredibly um, invigorating and uh, motivating uh, that, that we need to continue and intensify the work that we're doing now to try to get our patients off liberation out of our ICUs sooner and get them out healthier and help them to recover in the long run thereafter. Um, I'd like to describe to you today, let me find how I advance things. Where's the... Um, just the mouse. Just the mouse. Aha, okay, good. <laughs> So I'd like to describe to you today uh, some of the work that I've been doing with, uh, with a number of colleagues around the country on implementing particularly the wake up and breathe component of, um, of improved sedation management to early liberation. Uh, I have received honoraria from Premier Healthcare Alliance for lectures on VAE surveillance. And uh, you must be asking, where do I as an infectious disease doctor and infection control hospital epidemiologist kind of a person come to this kind of a, a problem? And uh, where we begin off is with, as you, as you likely know, uh, CDC, with the help of SECM and another, a number of other critical society stakeholders, um, has been working on changing the way that we do safety surveillance for ventilated patients over the past couple of years. And they've shifted the primary quality metric for, uh, for ventilated patients from ventilator-associated pneumonia to ventilator-associated events. Now, we, uh, just to, to, to reorient you, uh, what is a ventilator-associated event? The, the, the hallmark condition of there is a ventilator-associated condition. And it's defined as a patient who is stable or improving on the ventilator and all of a sudden developed a point of worsening over here. You can see this patient's daily minimum peep went up from five up to eight. And that's a patient who was doing well, was on the way to, to extubation, suddenly suffered a setback. And that's called the VAC. We, we know a little bit about this, uh, this, this condition. Now it's been looked at a number of times, and it's clearly a, a potent predictor of adverse outcomes for patients. So it increases their risk of dying two to three fold, and it's a much more potent predictor of adverse outcomes compared to the old ventilator associated pneumonia definitions. Uh, we also know a little bit about the sort of things that kind of cause uh, VAC, VACs. It tends to be caused by one of four conditions primarily. It's pneumonia, it's ARDS, it's pulmonary edema, and atelectasis. And these findings, this is a one snapshot from Australia, but similar findings have been found in Europe and the United States as well. Those are the primary conditions. If you think about it, those are all uh, nosocomial complications. They're things we're well experienced with. We know a little bit about how to prevent them. So this seems to be a target that we can, uh, we can attack. And so um, the argument that CDC and I have been making is that event that associated event surveillance has shift really for us is an incredible patient safety opportunity. And I say that because this new metric provides a number of advantages. It broadens our awareness of the kinds of uh, problems that our patients are suffering. It's more than simply pneumonia alone. It's also these other critical complications. And we know these things are highly morbid. If we know about them, therefore we can then go ahead and do something about preventing them. And now, as a contrast to VAP, we have a much more um, objective and reliable metric in order to, to track whether we're actually able to, able to make an impact or not. So that's what we know about these new VAEs. What we don't know about them <coughs> is how to make people better, is how to prevent them. Uh, it really is a completely new area of, uh, of evaluation for us. And so uh, what, uh, what our group with CDC did a couple of years ago is we sat down and said, well, how would you go ahead and prevent a VAE. How would we get there to this mystical endpoint where there'll be zero VACs? And we reasoned that if a VAE or a VAC is a global measure of serious complications, it's a non-specific measure of a patient who simply got worse, who suffered a complication of critical care and mechanical ventilation, the best way to prevent these events is to get the patient off the ventilator and out the ITU sooner. sooner. And we know um, from the work of some of the people in this room and others that the most uh, powerful way that we know of to get patients off the ventilator and out of the ICU sooner is uh, spontaneous awakening trials, spontaneous breathing trials, particularly when they're coordinated together. So hence, uh, CDC sponsored this Wake Up and Breathe Collaborative, which was a collection of, um, of five different uh, uh, research centers with affiliated community and academic hospitals. Um, Twelve ICUs from seven different hospitals took place. It was a mix of academic hospitals, community hospitals, small hospitals, big hospitals. And uh, the goal was to prevent ventilator-associated events through less sedation, early liberation from mechanical ventilation, using the mechanism of paired daily spontaneous awakening trials and breathing trials. 
Um, these are our strategies. We said, let's use an opt-out protocol instead of an opt-in protocol. And the key idea over here was to shift the locus of control from the physicians over to nurses and respiratory therapists. We know that as doctors, we often, in theory, know what's best to do, but sometimes um, the complexities of, of day-to-day management preclude us from um, doing what, what appear to be the, the small things uh, that, uh, that, that, that somehow uh, escape our radar. But uh, we also know that nurses and respiratory therapists are really good at um, making protocols happen, um, and making things happen on a regular and predictable kind of a basis. And so we said, instead of waiting for the doctor to say, give this patient a spontaneous awakening trial or a breathing trial, we said, uh, the nurses and the therapists will automatically do this for every single patient, every single day, whenever it's safe to do so. Uh, we had a protocol that was based on the work of Gerard and colleagues and Wes Ely uh, that was uh, to create a narrow set of well-defined contraindications for when a patient could not qualify or for an SAT or an SBT. And then we created a multi-center learning collaborative to aid the implementation. And over here we borrowed deeply from uh, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. We actually had a lot of direct um, advice and assistance from them on the, the running of this collaborative. We used an all-teach, all-learn model, an idea that every single member uh, that was participating in the collaborative had something to, to learn from everybody else and something that they could teach everybody else. Um, so every participating unit designated a nurse, a respiratory therapist, and a physician champion. Uh, we began with a kickoff meeting down at CDC where they oriented us to why this was for them an important public health priority and to, uh, to review the nature of the protocol, to educate and to motivate people. We also had another, another in-person meeting about six months later to consolidate and, and uh, plan our next steps. Um, each uh, ICU provided monthly written progress reports um, summarizing their progresses, their challenges, their victories, their failures uh, to that point, as well as setting out their goals for the forthcoming month. Uh, we also hold a, held a monthly uh, web-based collaborative calls to, uh, to share victories and to brainstorm ways that we could try to solve some of the problems that, that, uh, that we were all facing. Um, we shared back data with participating units on a monthly basis as well that showed their own particular performance rates, on not only on SATs and SBTs, the pairing of SATs and SBTs, um, as well as their outcomes, their mean duration of mechanical ventilation, their VAE rates, um, their rates of converting an SBT to an extubation, so on and so forth. Uh, we also provide a comparative rates. How are you doing as a medical ICU compared to other medical ICUs? Um, and we had a lot of help along the way from a lot of expert uh, uh, faculty, including Wes, Michelle Ballas, Terry Klemmer, John Jernigan, and others. Here's a sample extract from one of the monthly reports. This is a real um, extract from a real report from one of our ICUs over here. And uh, you can see their goal over here to improve the rate of SAT initiation on eligible patients and to improve documentation about efforts to accurately reflect our progress. And this was their insight from the, the prior month over here. Their test of change was perform SATs even on a patient who they predict will not pass an SBT. And lo and behold, some of those patients actually went on to pass their SBTs. Here's their lesson learned. SATs independent of our bias on whether or not someone will pass an SBT. And what I lo love about this particular report is that it captures for us so much of what our work of the, 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 uh, the collaborative was, which is that setting out a protocol is very easy to do. Um, there's lots that you can copy from now. But it's the, the, the absorbing it. It's the taking it inside of yourself and making the change in culture in order to become a, a, a reality that's so difficult. And this over here shows that that uh, our assumptions about what is possible um, can sometimes be pushed with wonderful results. And a lot of our collaborative was trying to get people to push their assumptions on what constitutes necess necessary uh, sedation for an ICU patient. Here's a snapshot of some of uh, the, the kinds of data reports we fed back to our ICUs on a regular basis over here. This is only a fraction of the kinds of uh, figures that they were provided with over here, but you can see their SAT performance rates. Um, this over here is a nice analysis of reasons that patients were not extubated after SBTs uh, because, because the doctor wasn't available, because the MD declined. And then these become opportunities to, to understand better where the opportunities for further improvement lie. And here's their, this particular unit's uh, VAC rate. So what's, what did our study show? Stay tuned. Um, we're in the process of, uh, of finishing up the, 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 the write-up now, but I can give you sort of a sneak preview to tell it as a very positive study. What I would like to share with you today, though, is some of the lessons that we learned through the design and the implementation of this, this collaborative. And I'm going to show, talk to you about getting the right people on the bus, education, the spirit of the law matters more than the letter of the law, assess performance, not just documentation. It's a marathon, not a sprint and choose the denominated fit the intervention and there's always more that can be done. 
So first of all, get the right people on the uh, bus together. Um, this truly does take a, uh, a, a full village in order to make this come to life. So we need, we end it, as I said, with our physician, nurse, and respiratory therapist champions over there, but that's not enough. You also need to engage the frontline nurses, the frontline doctors, the frontline respiratory therapists, the one who actually put the, 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 the rubber to the road, as it were. Um, you need help from C-suite, the chief medical officer, the chief nursing officer, the chief quality officer to help give institutional support and uh, resources and, and uh, impetus to your, uh, to your intervention. Uh, you need the, the directors from the ICUs, the, the, uh, the nursing director, the head of respiratory therapist, again, to try to bring people along with us. Um, that's not all. You have to engage the local opinion leaders. If there's a naysayer in the crowd, you have to work out what that person's concerns are and help them to, to come around to, uh, to a shared point of view. Um, the night staff, an often neglected component of the story over here, why do people work at night? Because they don't want to be bothered by sort of things like this, like this. and so uh, nonetheless those are often where some of the opportunity areas might lie for really making a change. Um, the pharmacist, the day staff, and then even the, the, the unit clerk, if you want to collect data in a systematic kind of a fashion, uh, no greater ally can be the unit clerk to try to distribute and, and collect information for you. So um, I'm sure this is actually a partial list over here of the kinds of people and the number of people that need to be engaged in order to bring this kind of culture change to, uh, to, to life. Um, my second lesson that I learned was educate, educate, and re-educate. So it's one thing to have a protocol, but never assume that everyone knows about the protocol. Never assume that everyone understands the protocol, and never assume that everyone agrees with the protocol. So having a simple, single email distribution of, a, of your protocol does nothing. A single meeting where you discuss it for 45 minutes and then leave does uh, only a little bit. Um, you have to do that continued work to remind people about what the, the story is and find, again, those, those pockets of doubt or those pockets of question or those pockets of ignorance and um, help those people in a collaborative, respectful uh, way kind of work, work to some sort of consensus understanding. Um, and so choosing a multifaceted approach in order to do this, I think, is the best way, which is that to, to, to literally kind of to saturate the environment, both in terms of the physical environment, so that's, that's posters, um, the learning environment, articles, lectures, what have you, but most importantly, it's the hallway conversations, I think, that really bring this to... Uh, to, to, to life. Uh, my next lesson uh, was that the spirit of the law matters more than the letter of the law. And that is that I had to, 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 to learn that our goal is actually not SATs per se, it's not checking a box that says I did an SBT, but it's an understanding that that, that is merely a means to a greater end. And the greater end is minimizing sedation and speeding extubation. And so that's, that uh, checking the boxes alone is not going to do the job if it's not cultured with a change really in attitude towards sedation. And the, the best lesson of this, I think, was a very instructive study that came out of, um, out of Toronto, which was a meta et al. study on daily sedation interruption in mechanically ventilated patients quote for with uh, sedation protocol. And this was basically SATs versus protocolized sedation. And their conclusion, uh, uh, which came halfway through our collaborative, was, uh, was a bit of a shock to us. For mechanically ventilated patients managed with protocolized sedation, the addition of daily sedation interruption made no impact on duration of mechanical ventilation or ICU stay. So did that say then that we were barking down the wrong tree, we were on the wrong pathway? Uh, if you dug into the details of the study, though, um, this is what they found. This is the rates, the, the total amount of midazolam prescribed. In orange over here is the SAT group, and yellow is the control group over here. Here's the meta study, and here are the two prior good studies on sedation interruption. And two things immediately jump out to you. Number one is that in the meta study, um, they were using a ton more sedation compared to those in the prior studies. And the other here is this paradoxical effect where people in the SAT group actually got more midazolam as a lamb compared to people in the control group. What I learned from the study was that this was a, these were, it was conducted in ICUs that were still wedded to the idea that a patient on mechanical ventilation has to be sedated. And what they did was that when they did their SAT, they were able to check the box they said it the SAT, but the moment then the patient got a little bit agi agitated or presented a difficulty to, to, to care, they pounded them with, uh, with, with sedatives, right? And we saw that in the study. The rate of bolus was, was, was very, very high in the SAT group. So they found no difference in outcomes, but that's not surprising because the SAT group actually got more sedative compared to the, uh, the, the control group. And so this reinforced for me that in our collaborative, again, we had to work on, 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 on culture change, on the way people thought about sedation, and, and that we had to use every mechanism, even beyond just the checkboxes alone, to try to get people to, to embrace the idea of trying to get by with as little sedative as possible. 
Um, some more other lessons learned. Assess performance as well as documentation. So here's one of our ICUs showing that their SAT performance rates started at a reasonable rate, but got a lot better over, over time, went up to around 90% over here. Um, however, there's always the worry that uh, an, imp an improvement in the SATs of SATs indicator can be a result of improved documentation. If you do a better job documenting where the contraindications lie, then all of a sudden your, percent, your, your number of, of, in of uh, indication opportunities is going to shrink and your, um, uh, your, your, your artificial rise in your performance rate. And so we look, try to look at these metrics in multiple different ways. So over here, this is the same ICU. This is the SATs performed divided by the number of sedative days. <laughs> it's a total flat line. In other words, this ICU got better at documentation. And that's good. That's a victory. So they had to be clapped on the back for that. But in terms of actually changing the care for their patients, that's the, the next step for this ICU to, to work on. And again, those are the, the kinds of lessons that we, we're trying to, uh, to discover together to be able to, to bring home to our, our, our participants. Uh, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So here's a, a in tribute to, uh, to my hometown, Boston, and to the Boston Marathon victims from last year. Um, but here was uh, another I, one of our ICUs, and here's their performance on SATs over time. And you can see when they started off over here, they had a big burst of energy and started doing a fantastic job, but then they kind of lost the, the plot for a while. Um, luckily, they, they got back on board over here. But again, the idea is over here that, that a sustained burst of activity doesn't win the game over here. This is something that has to, again, be, be made a part of routine culture so that it's something that every patient gets every day, not just as something that a short intervention for a short burst of time. Um, and, and the only way you can, can in realize sustained change is, is through, through culture change. Here's another ICU, the same story. Great out the gates over here, then they kind of lost things and, and, uh, and, and, and settled down to some sort of middle course over here. Um, here's a, uh, this is a fine point for the epidemiologists in the audience about the way that you actually track your outcome over here, which is that you have to choose a denominator that fits the intervention. So the traditional metric for hospital-acquired infections is, um, is uh, the number of events per 1,000 device days of 1,000 patient days. What if your intervention, though, like this one, is directed towards decreasing the number of ventilator days, which in other words, shrinking the denominator? Um, if you don't account for that, you might actually see paradoxically no change in rates. And so here's an example of here. Here's the absolute number of VAC counts over time. This is dummy data, this one, but just for, for demonstration point purposes. So the VACs clearly appear to be going down over time. Um, but the reason that might be is because the ventilator days are also going up, out down over time. So if you were cal to calculate your VAC rate in a traditional fashion, VACs per 1,000 vent days, you would actually see a flat line, no difference. But if you calculate your VACs per 100 episodes, then you will actually see the trend still. So use a denominator that's going to show you the progress that you're actually achieving. Finally, uh, wake up and breathe. I think it's a fantastic start, but there's a lot more that we can learn from the PAD guidelines and from the literature in general about what we can do to prevent VAEs and imp further improve outcomes for our patients. Um, the next place that I would jump to is wake up and walk, um, but uh, more on that, I think, for, uh, for another day. Okay, many thanks to my many, many colleagues who are part of this collaborative and uh, contributed a lot of this, uh, this information, most directly, though, to all the frontline uh, physician nurse and MD champions who actually did the, the, the work of this collaborative. Um, thank you.